and art. We're talking about fear not. The first week we talked about Mary. The angel came to her and said, fear not. And, the, and uh, we talked about the fact that we don't have to be afraid of God's plans for our lives, that sometimes God's destiny for us is bigger than something we would understand. And even the steps that we need to take in the middle, we don't understand them. So a lot of times we don't take and do the things that God takes us, uh, God calls us to do because we're afraid of what it's going to take and what it's going to cost for us to get there. But we don't have to be. Um, the second week we talked about when Joseph came, or when the angel came to Joseph said, fear not. And we learn that we can live above the opinions of others because we live before an audience of one. We don't have to worry about what others are going to say because we know what God says about us. This is good stuff. I love this stuff. And today we're going to talk about when the angel appeared to the shepherds and said, fear not. And we're going to learn uh, that we don't have to be um, afraid of where we stand with God. All right, I'm going to read some Bible with you here. Um, Open up to Luke chapter 2, I believe it's verse 8 through 18. Uh, That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. In, uh, In the New King James, it says, Fear not, which is a better sermon series title than Don't Be Afraid. So he said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to... Somebody say good news. news. Great joy uh, to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped in snugly, wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Can I just tell you a quick story before we finish this? Uh, my dog likes to get snuggly. We have this like little six-month-old, 30-pound English setter, and she is the snuggliest thing. And so anytime, it's just is really cute. Because you'll like lay, and no matter, like when you're like on the couch, you like jump on up there, and dogs on couches, we do it because we got a dog. We like to snuggle, out of whatever. And so she like, uh, she, you can lay her on her back and like throw her paws around. You can like hang her upside down. She's just as happy to be snuggly. Anyways, whatever. Lying in a manger, Jesus is. Suddenly, and I believe maybe there was like a, a snuggly sheep or something hanging out in the manger. That's what it looks like on the, you know, in the nativity scenes anyhow. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others. The armies of heaven praising God and saying glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was a baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel said to them about the child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. And that's it. Is that the end? That's 18. We're astonished. So God, I pray today you would show us our, um, some things, open up our hearts, open up our eyes as we um, look at this story today, God. And I pray that again, you would just release us from the fear of knowing where, not knowing where we stand with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm massacring the poinsettia before Christmas. I'm sorry. Um, thanks, Tim. Uh, when we look at fear, one of the things I want to make sure that we just kind of redefine every week here is fear is the, isn't the absence of faith. Fear is faith in the worst case scenario. Faith in the what ifs of life. So when we look at um, fear of where we stand with God, what we're talking about is having a faith, having a belief like that, that where we stand with God is bad or wrong or, or what if, like what if God this or what if that, like I'm, I'm the special case scenario. As God looks at me, what if he doesn't look at me like he looks at everybody else because I'm like especially bad. And I want to um, talk about today why that's not true. And we can know exactly where we stand with God. And actually Jesus coming to planet earth and and revealing himself even to shepherds is proof of where we stand with God. You guys pumped? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) 
ultimately God wants something for us. God, it, like, and, and as, a, as a pastor here, and, and we built the church here on the idea that we want something for people, not from people. Ultimately, what we want um, is, uh, is people to get into a relationship with Jesus, find God in a way that's meaningful for them, so they can then find life in Christ and then f- begin to fulfill their purpose in their life. That his, like, God-given destiny. I believe everyone here has a destiny. And that's what we want for you. Uh, that's why we do what we do. Um, that's why um, I'm a pastor. That's why I spend time uh, preparing messages and meeting and coffee and doing all the things that we do is because we want something for people. Um, we don't want something from people. Um, that would be backwards, actually. So um, God is the same. Ultimately, what God wants for your life is he wants you to receive Jesus because, Why? Not because he wants you to be on the right religious team or he wants you to make more posts on Facebook or even because he needs you for some sort of uh, mission on planet Earth that he could never do without you. That's not like, that's like a high, that's like too high a view of your importance or maybe just like too low a view of like God's ability. What God wants is for you to have life and to begin to fulfill your purpose and his destiny in you because it's good for you. God wants something for you, not from you. And uh, as we talk today about fear of where we stand with God, um, if God wanted something from us, it would be kind of easier for us to believe that as we're not doing the, the what he wants from us well, that then, what he, then, then he would like change his opinion of us because we're not giving him what he wants from us. But how many like parents understand that like you're not like raising your kids so one day you get a lot from them? You're not like, someday I'm going to get a billion, a cool billion from my kids if I do a really good job. <laughs> or you're like, you're not like raising your six-year-old, like in the middle of the, 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 like the child training of the six-year-old who's throwing the fit and the whole thing is, is melting down. You're not thinking like, um, this is like, this is all for me. This is like a me-centered thing. This is not how it is. What you want is you want that child to grow up to be somebody that loves God. That has like, a, like that is well adjusted. That has um, a, understands that they have a future and that God has a plan for them and a hope for them. That you want them to be like a like a, a good person. You want like all of these things for your child, and you're not thinking about what you want from them. And same thing is true from God with God. God wants stuff for us. He wants to raise us like children. He wants us. He wants things for us for our own good, not the other way around. And so um, when we start thinking, like, God's going to be, like, really mad. I don't know where I stand because of it. It's very easy to get insecure because we're like, I didn't do enough for God. Like, join the club. Like, could any of us ever really do enough for God? Where he would, like, okay, yeah, you're the one. Oh, my gosh. I'm, like, just so pumped about all the stuff you did for me that, like, now I don't have to even worry about, like, uh, He's like, I want all this for you. And so the things he calls us to and the, and, and the things and the way he wants us to live and the, and the things like the destiny he has all on our life is way more for us than it is for him. And uh, we get, it'll be, we, we can't go further in the conversation today until we get that, until that sinks in, that like what God ultimately wants is something for us. God is for us, not want anything from us. I'm going to talk about that shepherd life this morning for a little while. And, and just to begin, what a powerful statement it is. If you had the most, if you had really, really incredible news, like the world was in a major peril, who would you call first? And you're like, I'm going to save the world. Okay, so just for a second, pretend I'm a superhero. I know it's not a really big stretch, just but pretend I'm a superhero. <laughs> and like there's an asteroid coming at planet Earth. And I, like, devise this, like, invention that's going to be able to save all of us. Who am I calling first? Um, probably, probably my wife. I'd be like, hey, Christina, guess what? I'm about to save the world. Why? Because she's, the, she's one that I, like, I love very much, and she's very close to me. Um, and so I think about, like, all the times that we have good news, or we have, like, something incredible that happens in our lives. Who are the ones we want close by to share this with us? The ones we love the most the ones that are closest to us. 
And so I think it like reveals a ton about God and the character of Jesus that when, when he was being born, this good news that will be great joy to all people, that he came and he chose shepherds. So the shepherd life. It's like think long haul trucker, but without truck stops and trucks and basically not much like a long haul trucker. Uh, they didn't have showers, really. They had, like, public baths, but it wasn't like the shepherds were lining up to get into them. So they, like, and they were gone for weeks and weeks at a time. Um, they, uh, they were kind of despised by society a little bit. Like, not super, not, like, really, like, hated, but just kind of, like, if you were to touch a shepherd, you'd be, like, ceremonially unclean, according to Ju- the, the, the Jewish custom. Um, and if you were the parent of, a do- you're, you had a daughter, and you're, like, looking to get your daughter married, as you did in that day, you wouldn't, like, you wouldn't, like, go look at the shepherds and be, like, which, this is, this is it. You're, like, not, probably that isn't what I'm looking for in a, uh, someone to take care of my, my daughter. They were, they were just kind of, like, the outside of society, certainly on the outside of religious society uh, of, of, of the time, the Jews didn't have any real place for shepherds in their um, assemblies. One, they worked on Sundays, they had to, otherwise, what, where, what's going to happen with the sheep? Uh, so somebody had to work on Sundays. You know how, like, uh, the, the law says you cannot work on Sunday. Well, there's just some stuff that just has to get done, and the, Jew, and the shepherds did that. So uh, they, they couldn't work on Sundays. They were, like, ceremonially unclean because of the work that they did. They smelled bad, and they lived in fields. Like, this is not probably the person I would call, but it's an incredibly strong statement about who God is, the character of God, that he would come, and the person he would tell would be the, the least of these if that makes sense. Um, and if, if you're anything like me, there's days I feel like the least of these. Like, no matter what level you're on in the world's eyes, you're the one Jesus wants to tell about great news. Good news, sorry, of great joy. Great news, great joy. You're the one. That no matter where you think you fit on this level, that like, that there isn't someone, like, God didn't, Jesus didn't come to like the the Pharisees, like the, the, the ruling religious class to be like, look, I wanted to tell you guys because you're on top, you're on the left, like you're the ones that are really the most important to me. I think by like going to the lowest, Jesus said all people. And as a church, as a, as a pastor, as a Christian, as just as a person, how about? Like, I want to be somebody that understands the intrinsic value and lives out the value of every single person. That there's not people who have, like, done more, who, like, deserve to hear the good news, and then there's people who have, like, done less and, des- and do not deserve to hear the good news. Or people who just, like, live wrong or live on the outsides. Like, God came and he spoke about this good news of great joy for all people to the least of these. Why? So, he, so we would know and get it and understand that we're not just here to speak the good news to people that we think deserve it, but that there is actually no one that deserves it and that we're all on the same level when it comes to needing the gospel and needing Jesus in our lives. Um, I want to build a church that understands this deeply, that when somebody walks in the back door for the first time, We don't force them to become like us before they can receive Jesus or be loved by us. I think through the Bible, and I I look at all of these stories. I look at Paul. The story of Paul is one of incredible significance. He was um, basically one of these Pharisee guys and uh, very mad at Jesus. And through Jesus' entire life, he didn't convert. er, convert, convert. Uh, He didn't become a convert. Uh, and then uh, he was persecuting Christians as the, as the movement started, a breathing threat, killing them, um, beating them. It was his plan. And, and, and in a moment, he had, an, in, in the, he, didn't, like, he had this encounter with Jesus on the road where Jesus called him and stopped him in his tracks. And one thing that's very important to me about this story is that Paul wasn't like, you know what? He didn't sit down with some Christian. And the Christian was like, you need to start changing the way you live and stuff, and then maybe Jesus will come to you. Like, Jesus met Paul on that road in the middle of his crap. 
in the middle of this hatred even for Jesus. And that change that happened after meeting Jesus one time changed the, the course of the rest of Paul's life. We see him as like the father of modern Christianity in a lot of ways. I mean, of just how about all Christianity. He's like wrote half the New Testament. Chances are when you open the Bible and you're reading the New Testament, if it's not the, go- the gospel, Paul wrote it. Most of it. And I think something we get backwards in the church is what we say is if you want this good news of great joy for all people, you have to begin to change your life and look like us first. You need to look Christian before you can be Christian, which is the opposite of the gospel. That's every other religion on planet Earth. You, you got to look Buddhist if you want to be Buddhist. you got to look this if you want to be. But the, the truth of the gospel is if you want to be Christian, you got to come to Jesus, and he will make you look like him. Why? For you. Not for him. He does, he's not like, he's not, he doesn't have this like internal like insecurity where he's like, oh my gosh, I just need these people to really, really like me. <laughs> and I need, them to, I need them to look like me to validate my, who I am. And he's, he's just not that way. It's important for God that you look like Jesus because he knows that's good for you. Jesus is the ultimate expression of humanity ever. He did it all right. He's completely fulfilled. He was completely at peace. Imagine peace in the middle of a crucifixion, completely at peace. He did it right, and he wants us to feel that and know what it's like to be human like he was human. He wants this all for us, and it's going to start with an interaction with Jesus. So as we build this church, as we um, even just go about our daily lives, let's not begin to force people to um, behave or change the way that they look or change the things that they do in order that maybe they'll be worthy someday to come to church or come to Jesus. I have a dream in my heart that this place is a place and will always be a place where you can come in here no matter what and you can, get, you can learn about Jesus. And you can be surrounded with people who love you like he does in the middle of anything. You're safe here. You're not only safe, but like welcome. And in, fa- and in fact, we exist for you. This is the only organization I think I know of that exists for the people who aren't members yet. We exist for people who don't know Jesus that they might get to know him. This is Ephesians 4. Um, that, uh, at, the, at the end of Ephesians 4, um, Paul <laughs> is writing, and he's saying that the church, as we come together, all of us, joined and jointed by what we all supply, we turn into one body that grows into maturity that is like, equals the stature of Jesus, and that together we can actually look like Jesus to a community. We can love like he loves together. And that's incredible to me. And I want to see that. And I want to be a part of a church that doesn't push people away because they don't look right yet. I want to be the part of, the, part of a church that, like Jesus, announces great news of great joy to the least of these all the time. Amen? Uh, I think about the way before the angel comes to announce this to the shepherds, I think about maybe what they were perceiving their relationship to God would be like based on what they knew. And I want to talk about maybe some of the things, some of the parallels to our lives. I have got three of them. Uh, that, um, that may be some of the things that they were feeling, that maybe are some of the things that you felt, and uh, um, things that we want to make sure that no one around us feels as we share our go- the gospel with them. Uh, because of their lives, because of the way that they were understood, no matter what, um, uh, because they mostly smelled bad, um, and they were gone all day, and they didn't, hang out with people, they hung out with sheeps, Um, and the religious establishment pretty much rejected them, uh, and and as well as society. Um, This this all may have created some distance from God, or more accurately, the feeling of it. Um, And uh, I think probably one of the things that they felt as they looked at coming to God is that maybe, is that they, they may have felt unworthy to come to God. Because if they looked around and saw 
all the other people doing all the religious duties and doing it really well, that, that as they look and they look at their lives and they're like, man, I'm just not, I'm not worthy of this. There's, there's no way I really ever could be. They knew what they were supposed to do, but they, their work would keep them from being at the temple for weeks at a time, and they ended up summarily unclean. Nobody wanted to touch them because then they, those people would be ceremonial unclean. So if nobody wants to touch you, how do you think you feel about how God, if God would want to touch you? Probably the same. Like if these people don't even want to touch me, God, God would never want to have anything to do with me. And there's probably like, just real honestly, these are like things that I deal with. I don't know if you've ever felt this. Maybe you have, but where you're like, man, I just don't feel worthy. Like, I know what the Bible says about what, the, how God feels about me. And I know what the Bible says that God is really for me and that he really wants to love me and that he's got this big plan for my life and that Jesus died for me. But if, like, like in moments of like real honesty, I just sit there and I'm like, but like, that's got to be for somebody else because I, I, there's no way that that could be for me. Like, he knows what I've done. He knows who I am. He knows that I stink. He knows that I like, uh, um, like I'll be here in worship and I'll just, my brain is just someplace else. I'm thinking about the Packer game or I'm thinking about like maybe napping. I've got like hands up and I'm like just this, what, uh, how much longer? Maybe that's just me. But then I, think, then I get into times where I'm like connecting with God and my heart is like, there's no way he could accept me knowing all this stuff about me. There's no way I'm worthy. I'm not worthy of this. Maybe that's something you felt and I think it's probably something that the, um, uh, the shepherds felt. I think Sunday mornings are like a good example maybe of, of why we might feel unworthy in the presence of God. Um, chances are there's uh, been a few fights this morning on the way to church. Chances are um, somebody screamed at a dog to get in the freaking house. Somebody. Um, uh, it wasn't Christina. <laughs> it was Caleb. Um, and uh, chances are, though, among all of us here, that there may have, like, uh, Sunday mornings get super crazy, huh? Like, like um, I've, I've heard story after story. We fought for 20 minutes on the way to church, and we got here, and it's just time to plaster on a smile and just kind of, like, fake it till we make it through. And then we sit here in worship, and we're like, there's no way I'm worthy, and I'm not ready for this today. So we stop engaging because we believe the lie that something we could do could stop God from loving us and accepting us or make him mad. So like we think that because we had a fight on the way, because we like, um, uh, like we're, we're yelling about brushing teeth with our children, whatever it was, that like we get to church that like somehow, well, we didn't do Sunday morning right, so now God's mad at us. And so we have to spend all of our Sunday morning like, sorry, in, in our hearts. When God is just like, that's not right. God is pumped you made it. And there, whatever forgiveness, repentance has to happen in the car ride home, that'll happen, and it'll be good. And it's not going to, your marriage is going to be good. Your kids are going to love you. They don't have a choice. You're their dad and mom. <laughs> it's going to be good. But know that God's not mad, and that as we come to God, don't have to worry that, like, He's going to look at us and think that we're unworthy. I think they may have felt inadequate. Um, socially, certainly, they probably felt, certainly, they probably, there you go, that's a strong statement. <laughs> uh, for, for sure, maybe. Uh, <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't cool enough. They weren't educated. Um, they didn't, like, go hang out at the, the local hangout places and have, like, intelligent um, conversations about politics. Or, and, and if we're just, like, honest, I don't know that I've ever heard an intelligent conversation about politics. Um, but that was uncomfortable because it's true. Um, 
Maybe you think, kind of maybe they, as they come in, they see all the Jews hanging out, high-fiving, like, what's up? How was your Shabbat? And they're like, it was good. No problem. 940 steps. I was in there. I was good. How was yours? 938, you know, just like hanging out. And then they walk in, and they're like, I was taking steps all over the place. I, had to, I was uh, rescuing sheep, and I just came in smelling dirty. There's like, no way. Like, I just am not, I'm inadequate. Like, socially, I don't, not on everybody's level. And, and I, maybe you feel that way sometimes coming to church. Um, and I hope you never do. Um, everybody comes in. We all, um, hugging, laughing, talking about our weeks, inside jokes, and, and you just don't fit here. Or like maybe mom, or you go over to, on the play date, or you go over for dinner at somebody else's house and you walk in and the whole thing smells like seasonal candles. And you're like, you swear that it's like literally sparkling in the air. You're like, how did they do this? Because you go home and you're like, this does not look, you're like, I, there's, they literally have no dust anywhere. And you're like, do they even have kids? They're just like sitting there. Like, how did you, are they real? I think sometimes we just feel, um, socially inadequate, and I think probably they did as well, but beyond socially inadequate, oh, I, I hope you never feel that way here. I hope you never feel like you're on the outside looking in, and I, um, w- one of the things that's really important to me is that there's not um, the cool kids here or whatever, um, that everybody fits, and everybody has a place, and everybody is um, uh, part of the family. Um, because family dynamics can just transcend that whole clicky, weird thing that, that can begin to happen. Um, when, you, when you're part of the family, you're part of the family. So welcome home is what we say. Um, we love you already because it's honestly what we, what we believe and how, we, how I live. Is that um, because Jesus loves people, I want to be like Jesus. I want to love people with, with like a real passion. And so for me, there's no in and out. There's no... Um, uh, uh, we've been here the longest, so we're the, 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 the crew that's the, the main center. What, it's, just, it's just weird, so uh, we don't want any part of that. Just everybody's part of the family. Welcome home. And, uh, but even more, I bet the, the stay, they, these shepherds felt spiritually inadequate. Um, their job made them incapable of observing the Sabbath. They were gone on Saturday, so each week when the church rolled around, they felt more guilt. Um, and maybe church does this for you. Every week, Sunday rolls around, and you're like, oh man, I either didn't make it, or I made it here, and I'm thinking all about the guilt and things that church brings to me, and I don't want that for you. Um, this is, should be a place and a time for life. This should be a place and a time where you can come to meet with Jesus and to be a part of what he's doing in your life. And if you fell off the wagon, you can sign up again. There's time for that. There's a place for that. That's what this is. And I think one of the things that maybe they felt was unloved. Uh, did you know the shepherds weren't allowed to testify in court at that time because they weren't trusted? They were just like shifty, like perceived as like shifty people. It's like thieves, like weird, huh? But imagine being a shepherd and just that's just who you are because that's who everybody else was and you just got that label. Labels, huh? <laughs> I just want to be a church that doesn't buy labels, that doesn't read the story as like, doesn't read the headline and think they understand the story. Here's the, uh, here's something I I was, I read an article this week, it was really great, in GQ magazine, and it was talking, one of the things that the the pastor in the article was talking about uh, was the idea of headlines. And uh, I don't know, when I read my news on a daily basis, I just basically read the headlines. I go, I get, the, I get the New York Times in my email, and I only get to open 10 articles a month. So the, at most, I'll read 10 full articles from the newspaper a month. But usually, I'm just reading headlines, 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 headlines. And, like, and I read these headlines like I understand the whole story. And uh, how many know how, like, how much it hurts to have your life reduced to a headline? Because you don't know the whole story. And so if we reduce this shepherd's life to a headline and we look at him and we're like, man, he's a shepherd, so then he's this and he's this and he's this and he's this. He's stinky. He's a thief. 
He's never going to be able to amount to anything. He's never, and you're like, all, you, all I said was you're a shepherd, and you read all of that into the story. How many of us have headlines in our lives that we wouldn't be proud of the headline, but we're proud of the story? Like, like God is doing an incredible thing in us, and that maybe the headline doesn't look that awesome. We, uh, <laughs> my wife and I, were going to be uh, launching a church um, in a few months in Virginia Beach, and um, we, uh, the headline could read something like, uh, we're just going to go broke here in a minute, I'm not, neither one of us is going to have a job by the end of April, uh, by the end of March, actually, and uh, lose it all, run away, whatever. Uh, but there's so much more that God is in the middle of doing. Um, and just like real honestly, uh, uh, Christine and I don't have any children, and this has been a struggle, um, something we've been like trying to dig up for a while. And um, the, the headline there isn't one that we're like all that pumped about, and that like you should be having kids by now. Why don't you guys have any kids? Or like, where are your kids? And, you know, we've been married for five years now, and we get these kind of questions all the time. And um, uh, like, so you, you're meeting someone for the first time. You sit down, and you're like, hey. Uh, they're like, oh, do you have any kids? And you're like, no, not yet. And you're like, I wish you could hear this whole story. But that's just like, we're not in that place. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't want to like, I'm just meeting you. I don't want to like, here's the, th- you got time? You got and uh, um, so we get labeled, I think, sometimes. And not, it's just kind of like it's part of the, the headline thing. And what I, I don't want to be is the kind of church that reads into headlines. Because I don't think God's the kind of God that reads into headlines. And I don't think Jesus is the kind of person that reads into these headlines. And so as we look at people in our lives and we look at uh, people that walk through the door, uh, uh, Jesus said it this way. He said, don't like give preference to one person or another as they walk into the synagogue. Don't give like one person the better seat because they have more money and one person the other seat because they don't have any money. Like that's so important for us to understand that when somebody comes in, we don't start to like read into the headlines. But we start to love people because that's what Jesus did. And that's who Jesus is. And if we honestly want to reflect the love of Jesus, we can't be reading into headlines. Cool? They learned, these guys learned, the shepherds, that they, did, they had an innate inability to fulfill the law or approach God based on their own worthiness. And this thing that we see through the lives of the shepherds is something that needs to ring true in our own lives. You have an innate ability to please God. An innate inability to please God, all of us. You can't, by your own power, make God happy about you, happy with you. Like, there's nothing you can do, uh, like, outside of Christ, where God will be like, you know what, all the bad stuff you did, you finally paid for it. You know, you spend enough hours at the soup kitchen, you spend enough time um, with all of the, your friends that needed some help, you spend enough time helping them move, you spend enough time uh, helping people carry groceries to their cars, dinging a bell by a red bucket, you spend enough time doing good things that all the bad things you've done are finally paid for. It's impossible. Because you know, <laughs> and I don't have to like explain it to you, but I, maybe we should do this. Tell, would you, just everybody around, would you just raise your hand if you've ever told a lie? Just one lie. Just even just, just raise your hand. And anybody without their hand up, you can just look at them and be like, liar! <laughs> you know, if you've ever stolen anything, we're thieves. Um, if we, <laughs> I saw some hands go up, I didn't ask for that. Jesus says that if you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. I bet that most of us in here um, are adulterers by his standard. And uh, all that to say, these are the things that are easy and we have in common. Like, God knows what's going on inside our hearts all the time. 
like the things we wish we could do to that driver that cut us off. He knows the wickedness and the darkness that's in people as a result of our own foolishness and our own sin in our life. There's no way we could ever repay it. And that's what these shepherds learned. And, and um, what God showed us by, by choosing to appear to these shepherds is that even though we can't approach God, God approaches us. That even though we don't deserve to be in the presence of God, God approaches us. This is the story of Christmas. I mean, you read the Old Testament, and it's a little, like, exhausting. One, because it's really long. But two, because it's just time and time again. God sets them up. Everything you need for success. Here I am. This is what you need to do. And they can't do it. And not only can they, like, they, do they, like, try really hard, because there's, like, very few people in the Old Testament that actually try really hard. For the most part, they're just like, forget that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be the king. It's cool. I got this. This is how we approach God. This is how we think about God. But it's never, ever, ever, ever going to work. And we see God's final reset of the law. So you see through the Old Testament time and time and time and time again, God sets up the law with Moses. It, it, It goes for about a generation before it starts to like drive off the cliff. And then God resets it with the judges and then resets it with another judge and resets it with another judge. Finally resets it with King Solomon and it goes off and resets it with King David and it goes off. Then not so much so good for a long time. Every once in a while they start to get it back set up again where they're worshiping God and and it's working. But what we see is that it kind of like one step forward, two steps back for their whole history. We get into this crazy moment where God's like, all right, I hope you get it now. No matter how hard you try to fulfill the law, no matter how hard you try to be right by me, it's never going to work. So he says that he takes the old covenant and he replaces it with a new covenant in the blood of Jesus. And in this moment, when when the angel appears before the shepherd and then the armies of heaven appear before the shepherd and they declare good news of great joy for all people, they're saying, he's saying this, even though you could never approach, and even though they call you unclean, even though they call you dirty or worthless, even though even in your own heart you feel like, I could never measure up and I could never be worthy. We look at this story and see that no matter what we've done or who we've been, God has come to us. Good news, great joy for all people. And do you see something that's really, really cool? When the, when the shepherds then begin to tell the story, everybody's astonished. Like, why all of a sudden are we believing shepherds? These ones that were despised, the ones that smell bad, the ones that, why are we all of a sudden believing these people who we wouldn't let testify in court, but we're now believing them as they're telling us all about this Messiah that's been born? Because there's something in their eyes There's something in their life. I've seen something real. And I hope you can catch that in my heart today, that I've seen something real. His God has come to us. Emmanuel means God with us. It's literally his name. Not God far from us. Not come get, not not God up the mountain. You better do your best to get up the hill and maybe, just maybe, if you're good enough came to the least of these, the most rejected, the most on the sidelines, the most like us. That's where he came. That's the message of Christmas, this good news. What is this good news? The word gospel literally means good news. So when we talk about being like, I preach the gospel, what am I saying? I give, I share good news. And I know that sometimes uh, churches and even, even maybe me get this confused and we start preaching bad news or uh, weird news. But I'm really into preaching good news 
The gospel message is this, that what we could never do, Christ accomplished for us on the cross, that we would never be separated from him again. And we could then be restored to the purpose for which we were created. He's given us life and a purpose. Christ did it. And if we feel inadequate today, would you stand with me? If we feel inadequate today, if we feel like my heart isn't worthy, or you feel like maybe unloved by God, I just want to set you free from all of that and say like, no, you are worthy. Why? Because Christ called you worthy. Not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done. I feel inadequate. You know what? You're not enough. But in Christ, you are enough. This is the point. That like all of these things, these lies, they're actually kind of true about us. Like, yeah, I was a bad person. I did really bad things, and I hurt people, and I hurt myself. I'm sure the same is true of you, but in Christ, it's not anymore. All the things we could never be, we are in Christ. And so when we approach God, we have nothing to be afraid of. We know where we stand with God because Jesus lives. We know where we stand with God because Christ came to become a person. God incarnate. Infinite cosmic power. Itty bitty living space. That's a Latin reference, y'all. God put on flesh to forever wear flesh and forever be um, part and knit to the human race. We are now, one with God through the blood of Jesus, we're fully accepted. The blood of Jesus, coming to God, uh, what, what um, the Bible says is we've been um, adopted as sons. And so where God, Jesus, when he was on planet Earth, approached God the Father again and again, Abba, pray like this, Abba, Father, my Father. We've been adopted, it says in Romans. And now the Spirit cries out through us, Abba, Father, welcome to the family. This family, yeah, that's important. Way more important. Family of God. Not because you did it right. Not because you're good enough. Not because you're strong enough. Not because you uh, did all the right things, but because Jesus did the one thing that we all needed. That, my friends, is the good news. And I was talking to a friend this week who's not a Christian, and he said, he was, um, he said, man, this just seems too good to be true. Like, what's the catch? And I was like, if that's what you're thinking, you get the message. Because this is too good to be true, and there is no catch. So I want to pray for us as we approach God today, maybe some of us for the first time ever. Um, uh, maybe some of us are coming back home. Um, and I just want to pray. Would you pray with me? And uh, as we just get our hearts just into the presence of a God who loves us very much. God, thank you so much for everything you've done for us. Everything you've done for me. And the way that you approach us. And the way that you let us approach you. I pray this morning for anybody who's never given their life to you in this place. That... Um, you would work that out right now. And for those of us who need to come back home, like, man, I've been nervous about approaching God because of some of the stuff that's been in my life. And I know that he can take me today as I am and make me like him. And Lord, I pray for everybody here that's in this place, that calls this place home or not. Uh, that you would give us grace to see people like you see people and understand that um, as we approach people in this community and in our lives with the gospel that we're no better than them. We were shepherds too. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You know, in Hebrews, it says that we can now approach the throne of God boldly. So you think about, like, where do I stand? Think about, like, knocking in the doors of heaven. Uh, do you need an appointment? No, it's me. Pop open the doors, walk into the presence of God, and everybody, like all the guards, like, wait, stop. You're like, don't worry, it's me. We get to approach boldly, knowing where we stand. Isn't that cool? Amen.